Please welcome Professor John Fox. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ahmed, for that. And I'd like to thank the Affinity Intercultural Foundation for this invitation. And I'd like to pay my respects to the uh, local Indigenous people uh, and their leaders. Now, um, so the interesting thing here is um, uh, that we are a great immigration nation. And that gives us terrific opportunities and challenges. In particular, I suppose my argument is that policies about immigrant settlement are really critical. Um, and um, what I'd like to do is to look at that stuff, about what are the opportunities and challenges, uh, how does immigration shape the Australian century, what impact does immigration have on our financial prosperity, uh, and the whole question of immigrant integration. So there's a fair bit of stuff to look at. Um, the key thing is that we're one of the most um, uh, immigrant nations in the world today. And I'm going to show you some 2011 census data just to sort of back that up. Uh, my argument is that multiculturalism has served us very well. But so much has changed with the immigration intake, the global economy. Uh, it's been 78 since the Gal Ballard report laid the foundation mm -hmm. stones for multicultural programs and services. A lot's changed in that time. And I think we need to revisit that issue and also um, uh, reignite it. And I'm going to make the argument for a more cosmopolitan multiculturalism. And I want to explain what I mean by that, for one, in which an international perspective, the fact that people are from all over the world and relate to all over the world, and it's not just Australia or just about Australia. It's about Australia, uh, Australia, Australia's people and their place in the world. And that particularly comes to a head on issues like national identity, which I'll come to. Um, <coughs> and in particular, um, you know, what the, the whole multiculturalism stuff was the first phase was based on ethnicity. Ethnic community groups would deliver it. People were seen as this ethnicity or that. And that was a great breakthrough from the days of assimilation, where that was denied and ignored. But it was also a limitation, because people are much more than Turkish or Chinese or Indian. There are also all sorts of other things. And stereotypical notions of ethnicity can be a constraining thing that doesn't take us forward in this contemporary age of globalization, is my argument. So we need to be much more relaxed about national identity. Uh, we need to build bridges to the anglo celtic majority and the indigenous uh, minority. And I think a more cosmopolitan multiculturalism will enable us to do that. Um, we really need to reassess migrant programs and services because so much has changed. The character of immigrants, not only where they come from, as I'll show, but their character has changed, their educator skill, uh, as well as, of course, the refugee intakes. Uh, and, but this is one key thing. It must be anti-racism. Racism has been, uh, unfortunately, a common part of our history. Uh, and we really need to be ever vigilant about that. So uh, we are one of the most significant immigration nations in the world today. Uh, often we forget that 24.6% uh, you know, of the population, first generation, born overseas. Right? Very few countries have anywhere near approached that. You know, we're much more significant than Canada, the States, any European nation. Uh, and also, there's a substantial number of second generations, 43.1%. And if you look at our cities, say Sydney, 61% of the people who live here today are first or second generation immigrants. That's an amazing thing. Uh, and it shows you how significant it's been. And of course, it's been central uh, to our nation building in the past. And it will be in the future, but we've got to get it right. Because, you know, sort of the whole thing about how immigrants, their place in the nation, how we respond to issues of immigrant settlement, are, I think, perhaps the most critical ones we face as a nation. You know, this tax or that tax can excite us, particularly at moments of the budget like this. But these are the fundamental big picture issues that shape our future. Um, <laughs> you can just see here, graphing these different countries in the world, the 
proportion of immigrants, this is Australia out here, um, other than Canada, uh, most of the others are much less than us. So just a, as a proportion of the population, just to give us that international perspective. Uh, that is significant in most countries, but it's much more significant in Australia. We look at the 2011 census, it gave us a good snapshot of who we are, the Australian people. Uh, and you can see here, the British uh, tradition of immigration and our colonial heritage is shown that the Brits still are the top one or two each year. Uh, New Zealanders are very significant, of course, as we know in terms of intake. But then, China, India, Italy, Vietnam, Philippines, South Africa, Malaysia, Germany. So see how many Asian countries <coughs> Uh, figure up there. As you know, the White Australia policy, which existed until formally until 72, in the election of the Whitlam government, uh, didn't allow that to happen. In the period since then, things have changed quite dramatically. Those figures demonstrate that. So what do we get from that? We get linguistic diversity. All these different languages spoken at home gives you an indication of that sort of diversity. Uh, that comes from immigration. And of course, the other aspect of that uh, is religious diversity. I think I've got a slide. But just to give you a notion of what's changed, how are things changing? So, um, you know, if you compare 1996 to 2011, uh, that particular 15 year period, you can see the number of British have in fact fallen, uh, the New Zealand have increased, but see this, the significant increases in the, of the population of China and India. And the decline of places like Italy, the traditional southern European nations, uh, increase in South Africa. So it gives you a bit of an idea about, you know, sort of how uh, the stock of immigrants is changing as the immigration net has changed dramatically. The changing face of immigration. Uh, ancestry is another way of getting a handle on this diversity. Um, and because you may be born, say, in Fiji, but you're of ethnic Chinese ancestry. So the birthplace data I showed you doesn't capture that. <coughs> the ancestry data does. Uh, and you can see here that most people uh, are either English or Irish or, 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 or um, Scottish. That reflects that British heritage of Australia as a nation. Uh, and then, of course, the big uh, European dominance in the early post-war period. But then now the changing nature of the new intakes in the last few decades are changing that quite considerably. So these are different indices of the diversity of Australia. And of course, religious diversity is another key element of that. Uh, perhaps disproportionately uh, important in many ways because of issues of Islam and, uh, and, and so forth. But when, you know, so we have this diversity across all aspects of Australian society. So what that data shows us is how significant <coughs> immigration is, how diverse it is, how it's changing in terms of the countries of origin, uh, and you get an idea here of this. So in this last decade, uh, an extra 200,000 people from India, 176,000 from China, 127,000 from New Zealand, but decreases people uh, from uh, Italy, uh, Greece and Poland. So this is this changing character of the Australian population because of immigration. <coughs> now, my paper really is trying to say, okay, well, all right, we've got all these immigrants. Um, you know, what should a, an immigrant settlement policy be like? The philosophy <coughs> and the policy of dealing with this. If we're the most culturally diverse uh, the, the greatest immigrant nation in the West today, which we are, how are we dealing with that diversity? And as you know, um, uh, and I'm not going to spend much time on this because of my limited time, we had a wide Australian policy and assimilation. Uh, from the Whitlam government on, we had uh, multiculturalism, uh, and it was particularly the Fraser government who really embedded that deeply. Uh, the Gal Valley report in 78, laid out the programs and services for immigrant settlement, including SBS television, uh, translation stuff, migrant education programs, migrant workforce programs, 
I mean, all those programs which you need, because the underlying philosophy is if you're getting all these immigrants coming in from all these different countries, you've got to give them an opportunity to get a leg up in Australian society. If all immigrants are behind, are unemployed, are in poverty, that is a recipe for social conflict. But if you get an, every immigrant an opportunity to, be, you know, to uh, uh, succeed economically, socially, politically, that is a recipe for a good immigrant society. And multiculturalism had that particular philosophy. Um, but we've seen it go up and down. Um, under Hawke and Keating, uh, multiculturalism was very enthusiastically embraced. Fecker, the ethnic communities, had a lot of political power. The Prime Minister would listen to them about what should be done about this and that at that particular heyday. Lots of money spent on programs and services. Uh, under the Howard government, uh, we had a bit of a retreat from multiculturalism. Howard was always uncomfortable with it. He only ever used the word multiculturalism when he was introducing his Minister for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs. It was Philip Ruddock, you may remember. <laughs> That's the only time he ever used it. He was very embarrassed and uncomfortable about the word. Um, he seemed to be much more enthusiastic about the rights of Pauline Hanson to speak of you than he was about multiculturalism. Uh, a great retreat, which seemed to me to be a, a neglect of political leadership and responsibility. A great neglect. Um, we then had the Rudd and Gillard governments. Um, and to some extent, there was some uh, advance there. Um, but I've sort of never been really convinced that there's been a great um, return to the enthusiasm about or an understanding of the responsibilities of a government in this immigrant settlement area that worries me a bit. Um, and one of the key <coughs> issues for that was that when Julia Gillard announced her first cabinet after she'd been elected, no one in the government had been given the responsibilities for multiculturalism, not even a parliamentary secretary. It disappeared off the face of government. How can that be when you look at the data I showed you? How can somehow multiculturalism be forgotten about? Uh, later on, she then you know, rectified that and had a, um, you know, the minister uh, sort of took on that responsibility. But to me, the fact that you can forget about multiculturalism is a real indication that things are pretty bad. Under the other government, well, we, we really don't know. We haven't seen much in that regard. Now, how do we do in terms of the world? There's a bloke called Will Klimek, a, a Canadian scholar. He produced this Global Multicultural Policy Index. Policy index. The higher the number, the better you're doing. At the very top, Australia. Right? We get the gold medal, according to his international you know, integration Olympics followed very quickly by Canada. Uh, and then you can see Bel um, Belgium and uh, down here in New Zealand. But Australians would be surprised, I juxtapose that result at the very time where the Gillard government forgot about multiculturalism. For a and my argument about that is that it's not just a question of what policies you have or policy framework, it's also a question of what happens to the lives in immigrants. How do they fare individually? That's the key mark of integration, not what policy uh, program you have, but the lived experience of immigrants. What's that like? Uh, and I want to look at a few aspects of that. So we won this stuff, um, but I'm saying, well, but Australians would have been a bit surprised about that because it's nothing that you know, sort of people really get enthusiastic about at a political level in Australian society. They ought to, because I think it's achieved great results. Um, so, um, I think if you look at the evidence, uh, immigrants do integrate very well into Australian society. Um, uh, if you look at social inclusion, um, uh, if you look at the domain of the labour market, if you look at the domain of, say, social integration and belonging, uh, the whole uh, role of <coughs> pardon me, immigrants in the political, in the political sphere, there's a lot of good evidence that um, things have worked very well. But when you look <coughs> at it, there are also a lot of immigrants who don't do well. 
I think particularly of our refugee communities. The report by Graham Hugo a few years ago, refugees have got the worst socioeconomic outcomes of any Australians other than Indigenous Australians. Higher unemployment rates, uh, all sorts of problems about racism and so forth. Uh, so really, you know, we've got to look at these things in a quite clear-headed way and see what's happening. I'm not just saying, you know, we're so wonderful that there aren't any problems. With social cohesion, if you look at the work uh, that's done um, by Andrew Marcus with the Scanlon Foundation, and he's done a number of bits of research about social cohesion, generally we're travelling pretty well. It's a good measure of that, uh, but there are important perceptions like the Cronulla Beach Rights, which is, a, 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 if you like, an ugly reminder of how tentative these things are how easy they can be disrupted and undermined. Uh, and this thing about racial discrimination, it's persistent. It's still there. We've got to be alert, wary. We've got to address that issue. Just a couple of little reminders about the, the ugliness uh, around the Cronulla Beach, Beach riots we had in Sydney in 2005. Uh, and that cartoon, we shall determine who comes to our suburb and the manner in which they come. Uh, and of course, the T-shirt there, Keep Australia Ugly, mm -hmm. <coughs> was a bit of a measure of you know, what happened in those days. But, and it shocked us all that that could happen. But we should be reminded that that sort of stuff can happen again. Um, now, if you look at in the workforce, the big change is the number of immigrants who hold tertiary education, the big shift towards skilled migration. Many more immigrants hold tertiary education in Australia. Uh, than other countries uh, other than Canada. Uh, and on the other hand, immigrants comprise only half of all the employment in low skilled occupations. So what I'm talking about in a technical term is sort of like a bimodal thing. Some immigrants are very highly educated, some are very low. On average, they're doing well, but people don't live in averages. Right? People live individual lives. And the problem with a lot of this average data is that we gloss over the important differences in people's lives. And that's why I'm saying economically a lot of immigrants do very well, but a lot don't still. It's not as if we can relax and say we've solved all those problems. Move on, don't put any priority in terms of that funding or whatever. Racial discrimination. Some work done um, by some ANU uh, academics, including Andrew Lee, who's now a member of Parliament uh, for the Labor government, uh, about racial discrimination in the labour market in terms of job applications. You've got a, um, a foreign standing name, you've got a picture that makes you look different, you don't get the same result as if someone's got an Anglo name or an Anglo looking picture, right? An indication that racial discrimination exists in the labour market. Uh, but also recognition of qualifications. Still a very big issue. We bring people in because of their qualifications, but then often we don't recognise them. Well, I've done a book recently on immigrant teachers in Australia, um, and basically a lot of the work we did, you know, sort of to get into Australia you needed a teacher qualification, a three-year teacher qualification, <coughs> so you get admitted as an immigrant, but to get a job in the education department, you needed a four-year trained degree. So you could get in as an immigrant, but not get in front of a classroom because of different qualifications and standards. And that, we talked about, and I've talked about that in the 80s and in the 90s, and we're still talking about that issue, which is a form of racial discrimination, a form of market failure. Uh, unemployment, on average, immigrants and non-immigrant unemployment is the same. But, if you then start breaking it down, for example, the 2006 census data I looked at, I haven't had time to do similar stuff with this latest data, but the rates of uh, immigrants of uh, first and second generation, Lebanese, Middle East and Vietnamese, North African, rates of unemployment two to three times higher than average. Um, and um, also second generation Muslim males had a much higher rate of unemployment than first generation. And that worried me because often we say, well, the first generation does it hard, but they do it to sacrifice for the second generation who will get the Australian education who will do it well. This is one bit of data that's saying that that doesn't actually work. So when you look at the picture, sure, on average it looks good, 
but in fact there are a lot of pockets of problems there. You need programs and services addressed to that. Where are the migrant programs and services in employment these days? Don't exist, gone, wiped out. Um, the economic impact of immigration. Um, if you look at the econometric studies, my colleagues at UT, some of them are, are number crunchers, right? They're mathematical economists. They do the econometric models. If you look at that data, they say, in the consensus, immigration is benign. It neither helps nor hinders the economy. And I say, what? We've got, you know, 60% of the population, first and second generation immigrants. That hasn't had any positive impact. And the key answer is that their techniques can't measure all the dimensions of the economic impact of immigration. First of all, it's got to be quantifiable. Second of all, it's got to be narrowly economic. <coughs> Immigration impacts on all aspects of Australian life, economic, political, social, cultural. And you know, sort of these models just can't capture that. And let me give you one example. Um, I've done a lot of stuff on immigrant entrepreneurship. A lot of immigrants own small businesses. In fact, some become uh, the leaders of Australian industry. Think about you know, sort of Frank Lowy. Think about people like that uh, who will become the leaders of Australian industry. A lot of the wealthiest Australians, when you see Business Review Weekly put up the wealthy 100 Australians, a large proportion of immigrants are there. And a number of them refugees, by the way, interestingly enough as well. But of course, they're the minority of entrepreneurs. Those become the multi-millionaires and the billionaires. But think about all the immigrants that open up the corner shop, the restaurant, the little business. Um, very, very significant. A lot of immigrant groups have got a much higher rate of entrepreneurship than the Australian born. And the Koreans in particular have the highest rate of entrepreneurship. Now, this contribution of immigrant entrepreneurs to the Australian economy is measured in none of these econometric studies about the impact of immigration. Just to give you one example of the inadequacy of that particular age. So in my view, um, there are tremendous economic benefits of immigration. And I think immigration has been sold short. In particular, the cruel irony is that because of non-recognition of qualifications, because of racial discrimination, the immigrants we do get don't get the opportunity <coughs> to contribute as much as they can. So they suffer through discrimination and then we blame them for Australia not being as good as it is because immigration somehow is a negative to the economy. I think it's a really bad discourse that we need to challenge. Uh, in the Asian century, we've all heard a lot about the Asian century. Uh, and um, you know, clearly there's a lot of momentum moved to uh, China and India, uh, and that will increase in the, in the coming decade. Um, the big change in immigration has been the Asian communities. China, India, and Korea in particular, but not only. Um, for example, uh, with Koreans in 2011, nearly 100,000, a 62% increase in five years. Very fast growing community. Um, and in a sense, um, you know, these Asian immigrants, these Korean Australians, these Indian Australians, these Chinese Australians, are our greatest asset in tapping into uh, the Asian century. Um, in the early 90s, the Department of Foreign Affairs Trade did a, a study of all the Australian countries, who, uh, companies who invested in Asia, set up headquarters in Asia. That was, remember, that's when Keating said we needed to sort of turn to Asia. Not one of those companies had employed an Australian of Asian background. Not one. They're trying to get into Asia, didn't think it was significant that they employ Vietnamese Australians, Chinese Australians, didn't think it at all. So complete, you know, this sort of, there's a way with the informal discrimination, old boys network, methods of exclusion operate. Um, so we've got to recognise these assets. It's a great challenge for us. You can just see, i just done some work on the Koreans here recently. Look at the Koreans. See, they're, they're the higher degree of the Korean born compared to the Australian population. Just one example of this 
we're, we're sort of bringing in so, such highly qualified people uh, into Australia. And I've also done some work on uh, Korean immigrants in the Sydney restaurant industry recently. Uh, and if anyone's interested in that report, I can send it to you. Um, but I just wanted to show you one finding about that here. First of all, this is a clustering of Sydney. So this is Liverpool Street, Bathurst Street, George Street, Castle Ray. So all that clustering of Korean restaurants in that area. I've also got maps of Strathfield and Eastwood and this sort of clustering of those uh, in, in sort of forming a Korean ethnic precinct, uh, just to give you an example. Um, but here's one, just one slide I wanted to point out. So these business owners, 65 we did a survey with, right? For about a third of those, this was their first business. But for the others, these are the different businesses they had. They were in advertising, tourism, butchery, cleaning, um, car cares, construction. Uh, and you can see here that you know, sort of, this is their entrepreneurial stuff. Try one business, see if it works. If not, try another, try another. Just a mention of the entrepreneurial activity. How is that measured in the econometric studies or the economic benefits administration? Not at all. Not even considered. Um, also, about what about our, about financial prosperity? Um, well, basically, my argument is that our immigrants give us the greatest comparative economic advantage we have. You can call it a cosmopolitan comparative advantage, if you like. It's a global world. It's a global economy. We have the world in one nation. We have the world in one city. Right? That gives us terrific opportunity as long as we manage that properly, as long as we tap that, as long as we have an appropriate policy that allows them to do the best they can, um, as long as we don't allow the Cronulla riot type situation. Of course, it can quickly come uh, tumbling down very, very quickly. Um, uh, so basically, this is a great um, asset for Australia. In many ways, we haven't realised that yet or we haven't realised it adequately yet. Where is the political leadership on that? I get frustrated because I don't really see it from either side of politics at the moment. Um, you know, so skilled and business immigrants, they fuel uh, the skill level. These are people who some other government educated. They paid for it. We're bringing them out here with those skills. Uh, not only to urban Australia, but to regional and rural because we've redirected a lot of new immigrants to the bush. It helps the revival of the regional economy. Um, and not only do these entrepreneurs have an eye for business opportunities, they draw on their social capital, their business links, their family links, the diaspora of Indians around the world, of Chinese around the world, of Koreans around the world. Our immigrants from those backgrounds can tap into those networks to give them a business advantage that doesn't exist for non-immigrant businesses. Uh, also, we have a massive number of temporary immigrants coming in. This is a big change. In the last year, there was something like 600,000 temporary immigrants and 200,000 permanent, to give you the relative number, 600,000 temporary. Mainly students, working holiday makers, uh, and uh, 457 visa holders and so forth. So this is also because these immigrants then become, they develop links to Australia, knowledge, networks that can be leveraged in future times. Great advantages. Um, now, I'm just finishing up here now, because I want to allow some time for discussion, about the whole thing about integration into the uh, economic, social, and cultural landscape. Um, the level of so social cohesion in Australia, given the great size of immigration, the great diversity, and the fact that this occurred in a fairly racist country, it's amazing the degree of social cohesion that we've had, right? The worst case we've seen is the Cronulla rise. And my attitude about that, well, if that's the worst it's been in seven decades of massive immigration, we're actually travelling pretty well. At the same time, let's make sure it doesn't happen again because let's not get comfortable about that. But there's a massive social cohesion. The lived experience of it is this critical litmus. To my mind, too many immigrants are excluded from the labour market, from social activity, from issues of identity, uh, and so forth. 
uh, and there's too much individual and institutional racism still around, uh, and many immigrants don't see themselves valued or included in the nation. These are our challenges. We can't rest and be so say, oh, well, we won the gold medal in the Interracial Olympics, we're, we're okay, we don't need to do it. You cannot do that. You can't let your guard down on this. So, immigration's changed dramatically, the global economy's changed, but what we need to do is we need to re-energise, re-imagine and re-evaluate multicultures. We need to give it what I call a 21st century makeover or a cosmopolitan makeover. Uh, and I think this is our greatest challenge, and I just want to spend the last minute or so just explaining a little bit more about what I mean by this cosmopolitan makeover. Um, now, I've done a lot of work with young immigrants, immigrant youth, uh, Muslims and others in Sydney and other parts of Australia just in the last few years. And uh, a lot of, I did a survey in, in the late, uh, late part of last decade about young people. And we asked them, so I say, you know, what's your identity? And more than half of them did not include Australian in that identity. You know, they said they were Lebanese or they were Muslim something or they were, or, and then, so, so, and then, uh, so here's an issue about that. Uh, my attitude is that the global world is a cosmopolitan world where people are connected to the world. Their families overseas, through the media, through the internet, through stuff like global cultural stuff, they're connected everywhere. Right? They don't see Australia as an isolated part, separate from, caged off from anywhere else. It's just part of the world. So when they sort of look at that, they're expressing a cosmopolitan identity about their past and their present and their future. And we ought to be very, very relaxed about that. I said to people, you know, the immigration department who funded this research sat on it for three and a half years. They didn't want to publish it. All the other aspects were terrific. There were strong aspirations. People really sort of, you know, sort of were doing very well. They sort of thought their future was great. Uh, it was a terrific report about how multicultural is working. The only thing is that a number of these people didn't identify as Australian. And somehow that was a problem and we shouldn't publish this. Whereas my argument to them was, this is what we see all around the world. We ought to have a multiculturalism that's not nationalistic in the old nationalistic sense. That's isolated and separated. It's nationalistic in the new cosmopolitan global sense of nation. And we ought to be very relaxed about that. Uh, and that's what, what a new um, uh, cosmopolitan multiculturalism would allow us. To break from this notion where people were linked with their ethnicity only, Italian or Greek, and that was somehow fixed and didn't change. And now we're at a much, much more multivocal view about that. Uh, we've also got to include the Anglo majority in the multiculturalism project in a way that hasn't had before. The common attitude was that multiculturalism, that's for walks. The whole Australian nation is cosmopolitan. It's not just for immigrants or of whatever generation but also the indigenous people who are now struggling for the constitutional recognition, for reconciliation, they've got to be included in this whole sort of, you know, sort of multicultural nation. And I think by revisiting the philosophy of multiculturalism, by redefining what it means to be Australian as part of the Australian nation, gives us an opportunity to do that. At the same time, the programs and services we developed in 78 under the Gallup Valley Report are four decades old. The world's changed a lot in that time. What's appropriate, what's not? Immigrants have changed, they're still there from different ways. What, what resonates now? What is a multiculturalism to take us to the next two or three decades? And this is what I mean by cosmopolitan multiculturalism. We need new multicultural programs and services, but we need to keep our eye on the ball. The fact that racism is the biggest threat that undermines that. Um, so uh, I've just left a, a list of some recent publications there that I could uh, send to some people if they're interested in following this. So thanks.